Hey world, welcome to another edition of Tandem Tactics Podcast. We got a slightly different uh, approach to this one than normal, but first let's get these introductions out of the way. I am Dan Brown sitting right next to my good friend. I'm Garrett, still here and uh, playing Magic. Uh, well, kind of, well, we're not playing Magic That's tonight, true. It's it, true. Is, is exactly what's different. But we're also here, not right next to us, but joining via Skype so as not to have to contend with the St. Patrick's Day uh, crowd in the city. Full disclosure, that's when we are recording this. I'm Cal. Uh, I'm actually only a few miles away from you, uh, just across the river. Just as the crow flies. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, a little bit different than uh, just hopping in your mom's minivan and driving across the suburbs. It's a right? full hour commute. New York City. We, um, last weekend, went to Grand Prix DC in Washington, DC, as you might figure. Uh, it's like, what, a... A four and a half hour drive, except it's actually a six and a half hour drive because it's seven hours there and seven hours back. So yeah, you know, because we're uh, sitting in Manhattan traffic for an hour just trying to get out. Right, once we got out, it was pretty smooth sailing. We got and, there and we played some uh, Team Sealed, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. We did their commander package. It was like a hundred bucks. They give you ten free. Uh, passes for you know, four-player commander pods. It was, it was a lot of fun. I learned yeah. a lot. I played a, I played ten games of commander over the span of two ga- two days, which is uh, g- grueling. It's yeah. about as grueling as a GP, maybe maybe a little lower stress, but uh, the uh, games take much longer though. I mean, two two and a half hour pods sometimes, and you you, did, you know you've added up to more time playing Magic than a, playing and winning the GP. Uh, you, possi- well, possibly. Well, if, if, if you've won the GP, you've probably played it. That much magic, but you know, we, we left while the GP was was still going on. That's but true. It, it was it was definitely the most, uh, I guess the the most magic I ever played um, in a concentrated stretch. And I'm still kind of like subconsciously filtering through everything that happened and making sense of all the, you know, weird intricacies of playing with people I've never played with before. I mean, but that's kind of the appeal of something like this. You get to experience what the grander meta game is like outside of your local. Mm-hmm. Meta game, and so I mean, speaking of local meta games, you know, we should probably hop into just which decks um, we brought. We have a volunteer to go first. Someone want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll go first. Go, um, go first. I, I brought three of the decks you guys have seen before. Uh, I brought Silvala, my Enchantress deck, um, Omnath, uh, Locus of Rage, the red green one, and yeah. uh, Mimeoplasm. Three decks that I enjoy playing and uh, felt they would uh, hold up com- competitively. I brought uh, my Teferi deck, uh, which is on the the previous episode of Tandem Tactics, and I brought uh, a new deck I had built earlier in the week. Uh, Gerard, Jared, Golgari Lichlord. I think, I think it's Gerard, right? Gerard, Gerard, Gerard yeah. Gar- Golgari Lichlord. Uh, I basically wanted to bring two decks of two different power levels. Uh, the Fairy deck was going to be my competitive, my cutthroat deck, and the Gerard deck was going to be the more flexible one, the one that could kind of uh, play a friendly game or, you know, um, or go full tilt if I needed it to. I kind of it took a similar approach. I brought three different decks. Um, the first was Aloro, which I consider, you know, maybe not my least competitive, but the most able to play a long game of Magic where everyone gets to do their thing. There, there, there's kind of a difference. Like, I think part of the underlying social contract of any multiplayer game is that everyone's trying to win, right? That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it challenging. But... Aloro isn't like an all-in, early turn combo, leaves people feeling salty because they didn't get to do anything. Um, Unlike. <laughs> well, well, so we're getting there. Um, Alicia was the second deck, which is a little more competitive, and it does have a combo finisher. But again, you know, in red, white, black, lots of great removal spells, lots of interaction. So not entirely unlike Aloro. It shares two colors in common, right? Um, and then <laughs> my most competitive deck, the deck I busted out, when I felt like I was surrounded by people who really brought the heat, or if I just, like, needed a win. Um, (laughs) It's actually a deck that um, you haven't seen before in its current form. It is an adaptation of the Chromat build I played in the last Tandem Tactics, Um, but I've replaced Chromat with Progenitus and made it much more um, combo-y, much more competitive. I I basically fixed some of what was wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. <laughs> with Chromat, and it did very well for me. I kind of like the setup that they did for uh, the Commander Prize. I, I like the incentive structure they had for 
just how these games would be played. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I completely enjoyed it. I thought um, everything was very well put together. Right, they, they had they gave everyone ten prize wall tickets, is what they called them, and the, the, they were roughly equal. A pack. Yeah, like a, a yeah a booster pack. Um, and so everyone, all four players, and they only did four player pods, was given one of these ten point cards basically and the only rule was that you they, couldn't keep it you, yeah you had to give it to someone else uh, which was very interesting i don't know tao was did you ever like use yours for leverage in a game i didn't but i definitely did see people use it for that purpose like uh if you don't attack me this turn i'll give you my um i'll give you my 10 10 tickets it was a great incentive because uh well the winner got 20 tickets. Wait, so, wait, which seems so, balanced, right? Because right. if the winner was a total, you know, try-hard jerk, then the other three people could just, like, not give their tickets to them. And basically there was, you know, you, you, you could have done better by just playing nice and um, right. being hospitable. Like, yeah. often people who didn't win wound up with a little bit more, actually, than yeah. the person who did, if the person who did wasn't, you know, sportsman-like, right? Yeah, right, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, you could, you could end up with the same number of tickets as the winner if you were kind of the the person that uh, impressed the most at the table, or, even if you weren't the 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 last person standing. Or I, I mean, a couple of the games that I played in, um, if there were some some sketchy things that happened, or uh, even just somebody t- turned three the entire table, a lot of the time the person who was uh, was the most diplomatic diplomatic yeah. or just charismatic even uh, <laughs> they, they got an extra ticket which tied the person who um, who comboed the table right right which is some, something I do very well if yeah. I do say so myself <laughs> I sit down to the table I introduce myself to everyone I'm Dan I'll keep track of life totals and you know I uh, <laughs> I just I, I do everything with a smile on my face so I feel right. like I feel like I'm good at first impressions and that may have gotten me a few extra booster packs <laughs> um, yeah and it's a great structure and, and uh, I love studying like uh, like I'm kind of like an economics geek on the side, and I, I love studying in different incentive structures and things like that. And the the SCG Commander Pod setup is probably the the best setup I've seen at incentivizing the spirit of Commander games because we played uh, we all played at a local store that adopted a points based system, kind of like the Armada game system. Right, right. You get points for like different kind of uh, achievements during the game, like bringing someone's life total to one or saving someone from lethal damage and things like that. And those always felt a little lackluster. Like they forced you into a certain play pattern um, that you might not want to go, Well, it, it, that you might not actually want to follow. It's like and... you're not playing EDH anymore. You're playing a variant thereof. Like, one thing that frustrates me is when a meta has a, a prize structure that basically incentivizes a sort of deck that I wouldn't otherwise build if I was just playing Commander in a more neutral environment. It's not Commander anymore, right? Uh, right. And so the, the only difference with um, GPDC, the way they did it, the only thing that made it sort of not pure commander was the fact that I could say, you know, here's a booster pack, don't swing at me with the Eldrazi, which I did frequently. <laughs> but, but honestly, that's not that's not even against the commander spirit, though. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. think about it, no, it, but it isn't, though, because like it, the whole thing is it's a very political, very diplomatic game, and you said it multiple times, you do that very well. Well, right, so it's an extra bit of leverage that's not part of the commander rules that right. they're just kind of giving you. But no, I, I'm, I'm with you that it's, it, it conforms to the spirit of the game. I'm, I'm with you there 100%. It's just... Just a just a little it's a little bit right. not okay, I'll, I'll give it to you purest commander but uh, we're we're in the weeds here. <laughs> I think the the thing that the the SCG setup does really well is it's it, it incentivizes everyone to let everyone else at the table play the game, right? Because uh, the first thing about uh, if you don't let someone play the game, if you just lock them out forever and like they can't do anything, they can't play magic, you're not getting the tickets from that person. So on some level, you do have to let your opponents kind of get into the game a little bit before you kind of like go and try to win. Well, and I feel like that, in in essence, is kind of the spirit of command. Well, like, it kind, kind of. Game. I, I I hate that that is the first thing people say about the spirit of commander. Though I I feel like I, I'm I'm very passionate about this. I don't know if you can tell, <laughs> but like 
I wish that Commander was a little bit more universally accepted as competitive. I think that it's a stereotype about Commander that it's not competitive. Um, and, and I think that's part of what I'm trying to change by you know publishing Tandem Tactics Podcast. Um, but what this prize structure does very well is it allows you to play either sort of game. Right? You're going to most likely win the most prize points per pod if you wind up winning. But it's not so lopsided that you have to try to win as hard as you can every single pod to feel fulfilled, right? In, in, in other tournaments I've gone to, it was almost a winner-take-all system with prize points. And, you know, if it, it was at um, Gen Con last year, mm-hmm. um, which I did very well at, but the incentive that they had there was basically it's $10 to enter per pod, and the winner gets pretty much everything. And so everyone's going balls to the walls every time, and if you do lock someone out in a turn three combo, it's really feel baddy because... You just wasted $10. You just wasted $10 and didn't even really get to play a game of magic. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I'll amend what I was uh, saying by, you know, adding on that letting someone, letting your opponents play magic, that's that's different. That depends on the opponent. Yeah. And the prize structure forces you to kind of at least put yourself in your opponent's shoes. Like, what kind of player is this? What kind of game does he or she want? Mm-hmm. If you're in a, a more cutthroat pod and, you know, this player is okay with turn four, turn five combo... Great, that's what I'm going for. Right. But if this is a more casual player who's expecting the game to go to turn eight, turn nine, then I'm going to take that into account. And I think that really speaks to the spirit of Commander. Like, take into account what your opponents want out of this game. Yeah. Well, and, and something very interesting happened over the course of the weekend. I think we had more of the cutthroat competitive type of game on the second day, right, on Sunday, right. rather than the first day. And, right. and Garrett, I think you have a theory as to so, what was happening, right? So the first day, I feel like it was everybody who was just at the GP to play Commander. And I feel like that's uh, that's metagames from across the country, but I don't think people are really playing Commander across the country who are comboing out, who are these super competitive players. But the second day was the day that everybody dropped out of the GP, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. actual tournament. And these are the players who, who went to the GP t- with the, these high hopes of winning. And <laughs> And now all, all these players are kind of shuffling into commander pods, and they're the players with the turn three combo decks. Your, uh, you know, your five color um, dredge decks that win on turn one, turn two, turn three. Hopefully not turn one. Goodness. Well, I mean, I saw it's, some. It's possible. Weird, um, weird well, things. At happening. least the players who are a little more enfranchised, a little more, uh, a little more invested into the game. I think on on Saturday I got some sideways glances by you know going fetch land into dual land. Right. Um, but on the second day, you know, like I, I was at a table with like three mana crypts around me, and I don't own a single one. So, Although, I, well, you, you may have gotten some side eyes for just having expensive cards, but I, um, I got my my most uh, kind of jarring side eyes actually from the competitive players who didn't expect to lose to me. And then when I <laughs> when I beat them, they that 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 was that was the only moment where I felt like there was more salt than was maybe merited. <laughs> I definitely ran into way more salt at Gen Con um, last summer, and I think that had a lot to do with the prizing structure. I think that you know this prizing structure was more um, uh, hospitable to more types of players. Right? Uh, how did you guys approach each game that you sat down when you if you sat down with three strangers? Uh, I I feel like. By the middle of this, the first day, um, mm-hmm. I had played against like every every single one of my pods had a player I had already played against. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because um, it was it was a very like it wasn't huge. There were probably uh, close to a hundred players there um, in the first day. Um, and I feel like so I, I kind of started to switch decks around, make sure I didn't play the same deck against people twice. Um, and in in that sense, but I also kind of approached the table and asked, "How competitive are we being right now?" Yeah, that, I I started every pod asking that exact question, like you know, a scale of one to ten, like how how hard are we going? Is often <laughs> exactly you know verbatim what I would say to them. And um, I, I I got a general feel. I mean, some people played it a little coy. They wanted to pretend like they weren't as competitive as they really were, so that they had a better shot at you know winning because hopefully I choose <laughs> a less competitive deck. Um, but uh, most games I did play it safe and go with my most competitive progenitus deck because, I, well, I, I honestly felt like most games people um, were ready for an intense game of Magic. But um, full disclosure, progenitus did wind up going undefeated 
Um, and, you know, it's novel the first time, but if I ever did play against someone for a second time, I, I would not play Progenitus again. <laughs> and I, I would switch to Alicia, which is also competitive, um, but not not quite on that level. Right. Um, the thing, though, is I, I, in hindsight, I wish that I hadn't gone for the $100 commander package that gave me 10 free games. Because it really put the pressure on me to play the deck I thought could close out the game the fastest. Because it was it was a real struggle to get ten games in over the course of two days. Like really, I played twelve. So <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I guess you did. I guess it's possible. But part of that is one of the games I played on the the first day. Getting back to Tao's question. Um, when I asked the question, you know, how hard are we going? It was the only time all weekend that they were like, not hard at all. Uh, it was three people. It was a husband and a wife and their friend. And they were all pretty new to Magic. They were all pretty much playing out-of-the-box Commander decks. So that that was the one game I played, Aloro. Um, and it was one of the most fun games I played all weekend. Um, I did wind up winning it in the end, but it was, it was the longest game I played all weekend. Um, we, 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 which is part of why maybe I wasn't able to cram in as many games, right. because... I had a couple of three-hour games, um, yeah. just two. But you yeah. know, that's it was going to say that's and, six and, hours of magic <laughs> exactly. And I had a couple of games that uh, lasted about ten minutes. Um, right. yeah. I, I I lost twice to uh, turn three combos. Uh, one with Marath, um, and then another one with um, the blue green Azuri. Uh, he just took infinite turns yeah. on turn three. The claw, the so, claw of progress. The yeah. claw of progress. Yeah. Yeah. Plus sage of hours. That's pretty yeah. pretty wicked. For the most part. Uh, except for the game I played where I was in, in a pod with Garrett, um, I would say most of the uh, most of the games I played on day one, I wasn't comfortable taking Teferi out uh, of my bag. Right. The only time Teferi came out was after I had stood in line to get Therese Nielsen's signature for, for two hours. I stood in line to get her signature, a bunch of cards, most of which were blue. I sat down and just said, I need to play with this deck because I have all these cards with her cool signatures. And yeah, I've, I've assigned I, Force of Will. I want to use it. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I ended up winning that game pretty handedly. I guess in terms of interesting pods, uh, in, interesting being kind of a, uh, a word that's open for interpretation here was uh, the Zedru game uh-huh. that uh, Garrett was actually in the pod with yes. me. Uh, throughout yes. the weekend, we were trying to avoid each other in any of the pods. Okay, because that's the whole point. We want to play against people that we've never played against before. Right, and also when you get into a pod with a friend, there's... Uh, Less prizes have to be dispel any suspicions of collusion. Well, and I think again, you have to give a ton of credit to the prize structure that they have here. It kind of made it less um, likely that people would do that. Although, we... we Tao we'll, has a story coming up, but... We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this. So anyway, we get into a pod with... Uh, uh, a Zedru player, I bring out Gerard and Garrett. I think you were on uh, Red Green on that for that game. Yes, I was. And just off the beginning of this game, we we both asked how competitive are we being, and both players said that they weren't being competitive at all. So I took out I took out my less competitive deck. So did you, and we get the Zedru player in here. <laughs> and, and and well, to their credit, I think not competitive was. The right answer to that question, but this was also the the only only I think the second time in uh, my experience playing Commander where I went up against a player who was not interested in winning at all and was only interested in creating as much chaos as possible, which was interesting for a few turns and then just quickly got both boring and annoying. There was a part in the game where we were playing um, Baby. What was the baby's name? Child of Alara. And you ended up killing Child of Alara. It was somebody else's general. And the player decided, like, at this point, it would have been a completely normal game to wipe the board and start anew, and then we could start playing again. But this player... Yeah, there were way too many Zedru enchantments on the board at this point. I killed Child of Alara. Let's reset the board. And the Child of Alara player decides not to let Child of Alara go to the graveyard and instead, and instead puts uh, the child in the command zone. Well, so hold on. Means... Why was the game so confusing at this point? I, I, okay. I, don't, I don't feel like you, you fully established okay, okay. what so, was on the field. Uh, so it started pretty badly with the card Mana Maze, uh, yes. which says that uh, a player cannot cast a spell that shares a color with the spell that was most recently cast. 
<laughs> so if I'm playing green black and I cast a green spell, the next spell I cast can't be green. And then when I cast a black spell, the next spell I cast can't be black. And that applies to every single player. And so this, this is already a pretty odd restriction to have on a game, and it's making, us, uh, making it difficult to cast all of our spells. Right. In addition, there's uh, confusion in the ranks. Yes. <laughs> so we're swapped. Which forces you to swap certain permanents whenever they enter the battlefield, and an enchanted evening, which changes everything to enchantments. So basically any permanent that comes to play has to be swapped with something else. But it can be swapped with anything it else. Be, yes. And anything else, because anything is... A, it's an enchantment, and, anything else is an enchantment. There's also a moat. Yes, there's a moat. I was going to mention that. No one's attacking. The game's at a standstill. This speaks to what I was saying earlier about the underlying social contract of any game. Everyone needs to be trying to win. Now, if, if that's part of your strategy, like throw the game into chaos to lock down the board and you have a way to take advantage of the chaos, that's impressive. That's cool. Mm-hmm. But if you're just trying to, you know, take a crap all over our fun, yeah, that, that's... Yeah. But I gotta say, I did walk past you. I, I, I finished a pod and I checked in with you guys and I saw what was going on. And <laughs> there's a part of me that still finds it very funny that you two had to suffer through this. Well, okay. <laughs> I would say uh, Garrett made a very heroic effort of breaking out of the lock. Yes. I mean, like, we've all seen... and. We've all seen what the Angry Omnath deck can do. Yeah. And Garrett just decided that he would have a turn where he would try to draw his entire deck. No, no, no. That's not what I was trying to do. I did my fir- The turn that I made this effort, I started to try and play permanence to get everybody else's lands so nobody could cast yeah. any more spells while drawing my whole deck. So you guys had all these Omnath tokens that couldn't attack couldn't play any more spells because you had no lands and if you had a land you had to trade for another land that was tapped and then i could just keep stealing your lands right and then that's pretty brilliant right yeah. and, and, no and, and garrett it, it takes garrett like 10 minutes to figure all this out and then like he, he's got an engine humming because uh he could uh, he has effects that allow him to play more lands and search for more lands and those lands get swapped with other stuff and then his elemental tokens get swapped with our lands and things are going really really fine and finally he tries to break out of the lock and he's able to steal an enchantment that lets him tutor for instants and sorceries <laughs> and he tutors up like cross and Gra- he tutors up all of the artifact and enchantment removal in his deck and he slowly picks away at all of the enchantments that are locking us out of the game one by one does like 20 more actions with his turn, and then the Zedru player says, isn't Mana Maze still on the board? Oh, no. Yeah. And each of the artifact enchantment kill spells is green, green, and Garrett had cast like ten. three green spells <laughs> in a row. Probably like ten green spells yeah. in a row. And at this point, I was just... Well, and I it, lost it, it, all patience. It really the is the obligation of the person who controls the mana maze to make but sure that he, you're staying on it. He didn't control the mana maze anymore. Tau controlled the mana maze. Oh, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I guess I'm being loose with the term control. Yeah, oh God, this stupid game. Yeah. Why did you control the mana maze? Why did you switch? Oh, he probably switched it with you. Yeah, he, yeah, he switched. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I lost patience with the game. I feel like we've spent too much time talking about this game. Well, it's okay. Um, it's, it's very well, interesting. Yeah, um, and at that point... If the game wasn't over, I was going to concede anyway, and I think I, at that point I just picked up my cards and walked away from the table. Right. Uh, well, so this is an impulse. I mean, I have to admit, I had the same impulse when I was kind of new to Commander. I was like, I just want to do something crazy. I just want to mess with their minds. I feel like it's kind of, it, it's something that someone who doesn't play a lot of Commander might be tempted to do without full understanding of just how shitty it is. This guy had a moat in his deck. So I would say he's really invested into this strategy of... Well, so maybe he has an expansive collection of magic cards. I'm not here to guess, you know, what his... Uh, sure, sure, sure. Well, what's motivating um, him, but... But, uh, yeah, pretty much all of the other games that uh, I played on day one were really fun. For the record, though, the judge gave me the win. I'm just throwing it out there. After the game was over, <laughs> the judge gave me the win. I, I, so I'm it, just... It, it, it sounds like you deserve it. Um, well, and so after that chaotic and somewhat tragic but <laughs> eminently interesting story i have a um a more a more heartfelt 
feel good story about a day one game where mm -hmm. I was playing my Progenitus deck, and I, just, I kept getting these funny looks from this kid who was sitting next to me in the, in the pod, and as soon as I begin playing my deck, he's like, I've seen that deck before. He says, you're Pogobit. <laughs> uh, he, he, he mispronounced Pogobat, Pogobat Gaming. But I got to give a huge shout out to Carson for watching um, Tandem Tactics and Tech Deck Deck Tech. And for, he didn't recognize my face because he never seen my face on this channel. But he recognized my voice, kind of. He didn't, he didn't know for sure until I actually started playing the deck. And he's like, I've seen the Deck Tech about this. So right then and there, I gave him my 10 points. I was like, thank you. And uh, I did not use it for political ends, but I, I did wind up winning the pot also. Yeah. <laughs> Day one overall, I did feel, I mean, for reasons we've already stated, that uh, you know I, I felt sometimes like I was bringing a gun to a knife fight. Um, but it felt much less that way on day two. I had all, some of the best games of Commander I think I've ever played um, were mm -hmm. played on day two. Um, one of them was with Progenitus. It was the it was the only game I actually I never felt like I was in control with Progenitus, but I top decked a win basically with a Bring to Light. Tao, didn't you run into two really scummy dudes who were you know basically colluding? They they were doing what we decidedly did not do when we were in pods together. Uh, I want to preface the story by saying you know like you know first we talked about the Zedru game. Now I'm talking about this. The vast vast majority of my experiences at Grand Peak. DC were very, very positive. This was uh, one that kind of soured my mood for a while on Sunday, <laughs> which was um, I sit down and I'm about to take out Gerard from my bag because that's the deck I've been playing all weekend. And, and I ask the obligatory question, so how competitive is this going to be? And two guys say, oh, very competitive. I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's different. You know? <laughs> so uh, I swap out for uh, Teferi. And I sit down, and uh, to my left is uh, Niv Mizzet, the original player, and the other two guys take out Aloro decks, which was a little odd. This is the first time I've seen Aloro the entire uh, the entire weekend. And it's two people, and they are they hiding the fact that they know each other, or is it pretty? No, cool? no, they're they're open with the fact that uh, they know each other. But you know, I play I been playing in pods where people know each other the entire weekend right right um and for the most part you know uh i feel like when two people sit down who know each other they tend to go after each other first right right because like, you know, friends know how they have a history yeah <laughs> yeah um but uh things get a little weird uh when the laurel player to my right not the one across from me uh just plays swamp after swamp after swamp. And I make a comment. It's like, are you a mono black deck? <laughs> and uh, he looks at me and sheepishly says, I have other colors. And what it turns out, on, I think on turn four or turn five, this player casts Ad Nauseam. Now, for anyone who has browsed the competitive EDH subreddit or read some articles about competitive EDH, Ad, mono black ad nauseum is uh, an archetype in competitive EDH. It's filled with, you know, very cheap spells and rituals. The idea is that ad nauseum can help the player draw 40 to 50 cards before they run out of life. And from there, it's a very easy storm or exsanguinate combo to kill the entire table. I end up countering it. Game goes on for a couple turns. But like turn eight or turn nine, this player is able to bring back the ad nauseum to his hand and recast it again. I have no counter spells in my hand, so I go to play uh, Intellectual Offering to try to draw some cards and to also draw one of the other two blue players into counter spells, possibly. The other Alloral player at this point counters my Intellectual Offering. And I think my mouth just drops, and I stare at him, and I think I say something like, you know he's going to win the game. And the other lore player, who is this guy's friend, says, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is where my, I mean, it, not only does my blood boil just because it's a, it's a shitty thing to collude in any situation, but it's like, what are they on about? The, the, the prize structure, which we've talked so much about in this podcast already, is not one where they benefit from that. They're, I mean, they're netting effectively a booster pack. 
They are. It's literally a booster pack. Because, and, and, and after you uh, factor in waiting in line for a pod and playing through the entire game, you know, after shuffling up and doing all the hello, I'm so-and-so, how do you do, how competitive are you doing, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it comes out to like a dollar an hour just to it, ruin it people's does. day. And, and, you know, the, the Nidmissed player put up a good fight. He, he unloaded all of his counter spells at that counter spell. The, the Aloro player was able to count all of them back, and then we had a... a I guess a good time watching the ad nauseum player take three or four minutes to show us the storm combo. And, and is that like even that. fun? But yeah, so that's so not even the, fun. He didn't even <laughs> earn it. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the end, uh, like they they passed their ten tickets between them, and they picked up the twenty tickets. The Nib Missed player and I obviously passed our tickets between each other. Yeah. So in, in the end, they net ten tickets. And I, uh, it's I, not even ten tickets though. It's it's literally five tickets between them because right. it packs three dollars so they 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 have twelve dollars and they paid ten dollars to get in yeah between the two yeah of them. so, <laughs> so uh, i walk away from the table i'm steamed um i think i go straight to garrett and then straight to you dan uh and just uh, i explain exactly what happened you know yeah. i i tell your tables too that you know these are the two guys these are the two scumbags oh yeah i gave him the stink uh, eye the whole time too i was i was <laughs> yeah um in retrospect, you know, it was on my mind. Like, uh, should have, should I have gone to a judge? Yes. The after answer's that yes. happened, the answer's yes. I, I mean, like, personal preference. When I'm on tilt, I usually, I try not to do anything rash. Right. So I felt like, you know, like I'm steamed right now. I just need uh, a few minutes to calm down. I'll just play another game when when those guys leave and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, and I think that at the time I was thinking like, if I go to a judge, what what. What good is that actually going to do? Well, the, the good is that the judges can go and watch the next time it happens. But here's the problem with this. We're not playing a competitive format that says you can't do that. Well, true. So, th- yeah. in all honesty, there's no reason to even bring a judge into the matter here because we're playing a com- uh, we're playing a multiplayer format that actually incentivizes colluding, in a sense, in the prize structure. Well, it's a, it's a, I, I disagree. Part of EDH is the social game. Right. Right. And so if you tell a judge, there, there's no recourse they can really take because none of the rules of magic have been broken. And I think this exact situation is why um, EDH is not and might not ever be an, a sanctioned tournament format because it's, it's just that much more complicated to figure out how to prevent collusion. But if you go to a judge in this situation and just kind of point out and say, hey, there's some shitty stuff going on over with these two guys... If the judge goes and just kind of stands behind them in the next game, just keeping an eye on what's happening, that puts a certain amount of social pressure on them. They will not feel good doing what they're doing, knowing that it's kind of in the air that other people know. And it makes it more likely that they'll just pick up their things and leave. And that makes the environment better for everybody. I see where you're coming from, but I just want to point something out to the the listeners. Um, While we were there, the judges at this event were amazing. They really were. They they were there were judges all over the table. They were commenting on our plays. They were like you know just very very social interact. They they were interacting very socially. You know, not like helping us out in any way, but like commenting on the board states and like and and making sure everything was it was a okay like i mean there's always a judge there and i really 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 appreciated it i love the judges that were in the area oh yeah absolutely i, I want to double down on what tau said before this our our experience at gpdc was fantastic we're just talking about these things that made our blood boil because it's the most interesting stuff to talk right. about right we, we're the most passionate when talking about this but the the best moment i had with judges I think you were there. I think you saw this. For what? No, no, I, this was the this was the pod we played together. Oh, okay, right. It, it was with Tao. Um, for whatever reason, like there were hundreds of judges at this event, and they wanted like a group photo, and for whatever reason, they all congregated no more than ten feet from the table where we were playing our commander pod. And I'm talking dozens of judges, all decked out in their you know button up black MTG shirt, whatever. And I just look at Tao and say, "Check this out." And I just go, judge! And they all turn around. I got, I got all of the judges to turn around at once. It's just like a, a reflex for them that weekend. Yeah. 
I was really proud of it. I'm still very proud of myself for that moment. <laughs> I got a I got a, a bunch of really good judge questions answered for myself as well. Um, my 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 personal favorite one was the the idea between reflecting pool and Nick those shrine to Nick's. If those are the only two lands or permanents in play, what happens? What can I do? And the answer is my uh, reflecting pool can tap for anything I want. Yeah, re reflecting pool is cool like that. It's not too hard to get it in five color mode. But yeah, I I I, I have certainly had to ask a judge for clarification on that multiple times. Yeah, I, lo I love the magic interpretation of any color it could produce. It's kind of this uh, very uh, uh, metaphysical question. Right. Does it have the capability and at some point in the future of producing any color of mana? If it does, reflecting pool takes that ability from it. I know some people who know some people. And yeah, we, we, got, we got to play a game with none other than BDM, Brian David Marshall. Uh, he's he's a pro. He's a bro. He's a pro and he's a bro. He's both of those things. Um, I I actually featured on one of his episodes of Kitchen Table Gaming, which I think is now defunct. Um, but I don't think they're making new episodes of it anymore. I should say. But uh, yeah, Brian David Marshall months ago, uh, made me delicious food with a few other of his friends and. Uh, we played a game of Commander and kind of talked about it for this you know, show concept. So that's how I got to know him. I already kind of had the in there. And my friend texted me like, hey, you want to play Commander with BDM? And I was like, can I bring two friends? And uh, I did. <laughs> and, and you two are much bigger, like... I, I don't want to throw around the term fanboy. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm definitely a fanboy. I mean, well, I mean, not, like... not, not just of BDM, of like all these magics. Yes. Like for me, I'm a total like Johnny. I just like the cards for what they do and think it's a really well-designed game and all that so i don't get all like starry-eyed with these people but oh yeah but, like garen and i definitely <laughs> follow magic coverage like we watch uh the streams every single week we watch replays we watch the videos that are posted on star city and channel fireball um and so like uh one of one of my highlights this uh this weekend was actually uh um getting to meet uh lsv louis uh, louis scott vargas and garrett getting to taking a picture of us but uh, uh even for me uh um meeting brian david marshall was a, a treat because um bdm used to own neutral ground which was kind of like the uh gaming store in new york city for a very long time they hosted the first magic pro tour and a number of years ago I was getting back into gaming, um, and it was actually the World of Warcraft TCG that, that got me back into gaming. And I spent a lot of time playing tournaments at Neutral Ground. So, you know, Brian David Marshall was always like, you know, the Neutral Ground guy, the guy who coordinated all of those tournaments. That combined with watching him on Pro Tour coverage all the time and getting to actually sit down and play an EDH game was uh, was definitely a highlight of the weekend. Well, you didn't just sit down and play with him. You you beat him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I won that game. You, you, yeah, you, you definitely won the game. Well, I, with my progenitus, I had the option of bringing to light either uh, something fun or something to win, and I opted for fun. I got out my possibility storm um, rather than the time warp. So I, I like to think that I could have won. But I didn't. I didn't want the one game with BDM to be him. Like, not, I mean, I was probably overthinking it. But he's probably gonna listen to this and think, "What dorks!" <laughs> but, I think there were so many um, big name magic like celebrities, is what I call them. But uh, uh, <laughs> like there, it was amazing. Like just like having random conversations with some of them. Yeah, the, was the, great. The, these two all weekend. Oh, that's so and so. That's so and so. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, cool. Great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad they're good at magic. <laughs> Any concluding thoughts? Any uh, lessons learned? Any any way to put a bow on this sprawling conversation about? Well, I, I I think a big theme. I, maybe we can all say a few words about it. Is uh, you know like we all, you know, before sitting down with a pod with three strangers, we asked how, in some way, asked how competitive is this game going to be. But um, what I kind of realized over the weekend is that people have different interpretations of that what that word means what does it mean to play competitively or, or so just even uh, commander you know it, it, it's kind yeah. of the the nut problem dissonance with this emergent format there's no consensus as to what is and isn't proper and you know when you're within the confines of your own local metagame you already have an understanding you already have all those kinks worked out but as soon as you go and expose yourself to new players from other parts of the country with other ideas as to what Commander is and isn't, th there, there is some potential for tension. But I think that, you know, going to a thing like GPDC is how we 
work that out and begin to develop sure. a more common yeah. yeah, so I, I guess I'll throw it out to you guys. Well, you know, if, uh, um, if you sit down at a pod with some strangers and they say, we want to play competitive, what are you expecting at this point? Bring removal. Honestly, as much removal as you can. Like, I found myself almost not being the like the 3v1 or the the main enemy but um I, like the games that even like i tried to stay back a little bit um i was the only one with removal right and i i feel like new york city because the metagame is just bigger here there are right. more stores and there's more crossover between play groups like i i really do i mean and i think that our experience this weekend kind of validates this that you know it, we're kind of a more highly evolved meta in general um and so many people in smaller meta games and play groups can get away with Fo to giving into the temptation to only focus on what you're doing and how you're building around your commander when mm -hmm. really you, you you need ways to interact during the early game um you, you, i mean I, i'm never comfortable if i'm not sitting by turn three on some sort of interaction right right um, un mm -hmm. Unless I'm all in combo, but you know, that's much harder without the partial Paris. You know, one of the the all stars all star cards for me that weekend was a slaughter pack, um, and a, a new card that I, I recently discovered, snuff out, uh, <laughs> which are both uh, uh, which both can be basically zero mana removal spells, and just being able to cast those when someone wasn't expecting it and like disrupt their plan. Uh, was huge. Tao and I had this whole conversation on the way down about the way that I played Magic and like how I like I, I play to the board, and I think that's gonna, that's going to be one of my challenges for myself. I'm going to try and build a deck that doesn't play to the board. <laughs> play Esper. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, it's going to have green, so it's going to be something <laughs> green. But well, green plays to the board. It's just what it, it does. But it doesn't like I, I feel like right. I can build something that doesn't necessarily build up this this ama like the, amass this compo like thing that makes everybody think I'm the enemy number one. Well, I mean, you, you, you play the role of arch enemy very well. You, you, like, the biggest mistake people make is putting a target on their head when they don't have what it takes to back it up, but you back it up well. Um, you know, I mean, you, you want a lot of your pods, you know. Right. You do play a very explosive and permanent heavy game, which immediately draws a lot of attention your it's way. way. No, but yeah, exactly. You, like I said, you play the role well. <laughs> I'll, I'll pose a, a definition for, like, competitive play versus non-competitive play and, and see what you guys think. This, well, this is kind of a theory that's been rolling around in my head for I, a I'm really excited about this. I'm worried it's going to evolve into another 30-minute conversation, but that's... Look, bring it. Well, bring it. well, well yeah. So, so we, we can maybe if, bookmark it and come back to it if we need to. Right. I think instead of talking about competitive versus non-competitive, um, I think we should start talking about games in, in terms of turns. Mm -hmm. And on what turn is someone going to threaten to win the game? Not, not when someone will win the game, but when someone might threaten to win the game. A competitive game is one where turn four or five, on average, there might be one person who is in a position to threaten to win the game. No. In a more casual game, that's pushed later and later and later. So turn six, turn seven, turn eight, turn nine. And like the most casual, like the pre-con, if you're playing with four pre-cons, no one might be in a position to win the game until like turn 12. So instead of using this vague term competitive, maybe we should start describing games as what turn could it possibly end? That's interesting. I, I think that for the vast majority of decks that probably applies. But there's also, you know, we might be failing to consider stack strategies, lockout strategies, and just like really intense control strategies where, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that, that seems kind of combo focused, right? But, um, right. you know, there's some decks that are very competitive that try to play a 20 turn game just because at that point they'll have such a huge resource advantage and, you know, as many removal spells as they'd ever need with as much mana as they'd ever need to just never face a threat ever which is the deck that tau was talking about making on the way back up where he's going to make a deck with its only win condition is aetherling and <laughs> i remember this yeah. and and, uh, and uh, other than that maybe a laboratory maniac to make sure he can actually win the game if aetherling gets well let, uh, since dealt with let, and, but and I, I, let's, I'm just bookmark, saying, let's bookmark let's right. bookmark it we're not going to solve all of edh's problems in one conversation but i i, I think this is productive you know I, I i think that the more we talk about what is competitive what is proper what do people expect when they sit down to a game of Commander with Strangers, um, the more the format's going to grow, right? Yeah. 
Oh, I right, just one quick side note. I met the guy who got Prophet Akrufix banned. He's a very nice individual. He's bitter about Prophet getting banned, though. He's, he's part of the whole playgroup? <laughs> yeah, he was part of, like, the, the Florida, pl whatever playgroup that was with. He, he, like, claimed to know, like, all the big he the celebrity uh, ED, uh, EDH uh, the rules players. committee people. Rules yeah. committee people. Yeah, and yeah. he was like, yeah, I got Pro Prophet banned. And I was like, ah, I beat you. And well, got and that's, uh, the rules committee is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> we don't need to touch that yet, but... Uh, this is the point where I'm going to thank the viewers for listening. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> viewers, thank, thank you, viewers, <laughs> for listening, watching. Uh, subscribe to Pogo Bat Gaming if you haven't already for more fantastic Elder Dragon Highlander based content. And if you want to support Pogo Bat Gaming, consider contributing on a monthly basis via Pogo Bat's Patreon. There is a link in the description. Until next time, I'm Dan Brown. I'm Garrett. I'm Tao. Poop. And poop.